gentlemen, I'm excited to be here. Uh, we're going to have a nice panel discussion. I've got some questions. Um, and first, I just want to recognize Angela from Uber. Let's just lift this sister up. Incredible work. It is very difficult to organize events like this. So all of our partners and the entire team that made today possible, I just want to say thank you and recognize your outstanding leadership. Somebody's paying attention. All right. Okay, so first I'm gonna just ask Latifa to introduce herself, and I must say briefly, if you guys have ever heard Latifa Simon speak, you must put the word in briefly. Latifa, please briefly introduce yourself to us. She can say that because we grew up together, it's okay. You, don't you love when somebody just hands you the shade? I just got a hand in the shade. But it, you know, it was actually pretty on point. I'll be brief. Um, my name is Latifa Simon. I'm also a daughter of San Francisco, born and raised here, and did community organizing in San Francisco for um, almost two decades. Ran an organization in San Francisco called the Center for Young Women's Development, which is now Young Women's Freedom Center, really fighting for girls on the streets, in the underground street economies, in our jails and prisons. And, had a really amazing career um, fighting for fighting, fighting for our folks. I now run a foundation, um, the Akhenati Foundation, where we're providing annual multi-million dollar investments to movement building. To what, what does Akhenati mean? Akhenati is actually, uh, I asked the same thing well, when I was recruited to take over the foundation. It's uh, a West African uh, deity, uh, uh, the, the, a powerful woman who takes care of the widow, the powerful woman who takes care of the children. Uh, and uh, Quinn Delaney, who is our founder, named uh, our institution after that idea. All right, ladies and gentlemen, next we're gonna hear from Lawrence Parks. May I call you Larry? All right, Larry, take it away. Yeah, I'm Larry Parks. Uh, I come here because of Ray Farrell, who I guess is sitting in the back somewhere. Uh, he and I are members of an organization called the Potomac Coalition, in addition to what I do for a day job. And we do a lot of policy development, grassroots advocacy, and, and uh, fundraising for political candidates, particularly on the presidential level. We've been around since 1992. They call us like a secret society uh, because we kind of stay completely out of the media and out of the radar screen. And really what we're there is about uh, urban black economic development and making sure that that's part of any kind of legislation that's passed federally, and it's a condition precedent of our support for any presidential candidate. And I'll get into details about what that means later. That's good. Actually, we'll start, we'll just dive in. We'll start with you, Larry. Um, and I would like you both to uh, speak to this first question. So you both have led incredible careers, a uh, big part of which has been serving the public, whether it's through public service or nonprofit organizing on the grassroots level. Could you tell us how you began your path and how you chose this career? That's interesting. So uh, I actually spent 20 years working for a wholesale bank that was based here in San Francisco. That's my allegiance here. And then I recently opened up a consulting shop. But uh, even there, running legislative and regulatory affairs, I was always trying to push things on the bank on the community development side. Before I left, I made sure that $100 million was actually put aside and that they got from a mortgage-backed security settlement for community and economic development. It goes to a nonprofit organization to basically help fund businesses that would actually grow quality jobs. Because we figured that the nexus in public policy between the Republicans and Democrats today is actually making sure people can actually make some money while they work and that there be quality employment. Um, I also spent time uh, when I was a congressional, when I first got out of law school, I worked in Congress and I worked on what was then a sleepy committee called the Senate Banking Committee that became much more than sleepy and was able to write an afford the affordable housing program for the federal home loan bank system that's put about a billion dollars in affordable housing around the country and also made public the CRA, for CRA and humped the purposes, the data, so people, so the community groups could actually sue. So from the beginning of my career through the end of what I've been doing now, there's been a bookend about doing those kinds of activities. Um, in 1992, with Ray and others, we established the Potomac Coalition. Largely, we were around you guys' age, and <laughs> a lot of the people in the audience, and the idea was really to a number of, and I'm gonna be very direct, one of the things I love about, one of the reasons I was willing to come out here today was because you actually were, used the word black. So I really commend you for using the word black because oftentimes in coalitions, we forget what we bring to the table because we're trying to be so purposeful with other groups that our issues don't get brought to the table. And one of the, one, thank you. One of the things we did at the Potomac Coalition was we were, in 1992, we were going through the same phase. The country was about to elect a moderate Democrat, Bill Clinton, but hadn't elected a Democrat as president since 1979. Um, and so we, it was the last time we had somebody in office, I guess Carter was elected in 76, but the last time we really had somebody in office was 70 and 80. And so 
what was being defined at that time was there were plenty of progressive things to do except for racial inclusion. So everything except for labor and racial inclusion were on the table in 1992. And we were like, this is not acceptable, <laughs> right? Like our issues are central. Well, so we spent the last 20 years, 25 years making sure that we were central to the equation. Now it goes without saying, but it took a long time for the Democratic Party to recognize we were the base of the party. It took a long time to recognize what it meant to be the base of the party, man, that you couldn't win presidential elections without us that we are the foundation of every coalition that works for the Democrats. That if, whether we coalesce with Latinos, whether we coalesce with educated white women, or whether we coalesce with unionized white men, we are the central artery that runs through every one of those states. And so understanding what our power is in the electorate, and then understanding what we're going to use our power for, became what we've been focusing on a lot of my life. So. All right. I see. I'm, I should have used brief with Larry too. Yes. I'm learning. See, I know Latifah. I just met Larry. Okay, Larry, you need to keep eye contact when I give you that look. Okay. All right, Latifah Simon. Tell us about your pathway. Well, so um, I know Malia. Malia's been like this since she was 13. Like that's why. She was actually um, probably one of the most successful women, people, black women, people, but on the board of supervisors for two terms in this city. She was recently elected, many of you all know, to the state board of equalization where she campaigned like no, but y'all thought, you know, Stacy campaigned really hard in Georgia. You didn't see Malia in that car, you know, from, you know, Yuba County on down. And so congratulations. Just I appreciate congratulations. that. Thank you very much. Thank to you. Malia. Not only was she effective on the board, um, but she stared down the police association, officers association in San Francisco and demanded, and demanded that they change their patterns and practices. I mean, just fearless. Shout so, out to Mario Woods' mother who's in the audience today. Um, and if you don't know who this woman is, the SF Police when? Department killed her son. Yeah. An unarmed boy, he didn't have a gun in his hand, and she refused to stand down. Justice for Mario Woods, and we should all give it up for his mother. So I'll try to be brief, but just giving the love to, to the sisters in the room, especially is always really important. Um, I um, not only knew Malia, we all grew up together in San Francisco, London, Malia, and I. Um, what's important about I think our story, and I got into politics only two years ago, um, but I had been running organizations here in San Francisco. Um, Liz Jackson is also in the audience, who's a deep mentor of mine, working with young folks on the ground who were very, 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 I feel like, forgotten about. Not only, not only by systems, but in some extent, their communities and families. Um, and running the Center for Young Women's Development and reducing recidivism amongst a population of young women who all they needed was economic opportunities and love, and we hired 500 women. I was 19 when I became the executive director with a baby on my hip. Kamala Harris asked me when she became the district attorney here um, to run a, and start a program with her called the Back on Track program. Many of you have been reading about it. I worked there and I ran that program and we walked hundreds of black kids out of jail every single day. They wrote their own court agreements and we found people jobs. And so we can also talk about Kamala Harris another day, but I'm gonna really push for, to make sure that she's the president of the United States. So hold on the conversation. Um, I um, decided to run for office um, two years ago after my husband passed away and from cancer and I had two babies and it was one of the most important things that I could do after running institutions, giving away millions of dollars to movement groups. Um, I wanted to um, have a place not only at the table, but be a decision maker. Um, Bay Area Rapid Transit is one of the few institutions in the United States that actually has transit institutions that has an elected board. Um, I had to run in 19 cities and I had to raise almost $500,000, the most ever raised for that office, because transit justice to me, again, being on my own, dedicated not only to public transportation, um, but I rely on it. We needed black voice. Um, and I'm just so proud. Two weeks ago, we just named the street outside of uh, Fruitvale Station, Oscar Grant Station, and that is why, or Oscar Grant Road, but that's why we absolutely definitely need to be at every single table. Um, so I'm watching people like Malia lead, and I just want to lead like you. Well, you know, I got a question for you, Latifah. As you can see, this is a serious, this is black love right here on the stage. Can't wait for this weekend. Are you guys going to the Black, the black Joy Parade? Well, Latifah, tell me, 
When you look back at your career, you've done a lot. You've accomplished a lot in a very short period of time. Executive director at by the age of 19, single mother also at that particular time. Uh, you've been fighting and organizing communities, serving on the grassroots level. Um, what have you found to be the most meaningful part of your journey? Um, if I could go back and if I could actually survive in San Francisco, which I cannot, um, um, I would actually, I mean, the, the best work that I ever did was working inside with young people. Um, when young people um, find themselves taken by the state and put in, put in the control of the state, unless you've been and seen that or experienced how wrong, how wrong, deeply racist systems are. If you go to juvenile hall, even today, 75% African American, we make up again, London said less than 6% of the population, working with girls and fighting for their freedom, their literal freedom. Girls who had never touched, had no violent crimes, but were put in cages for being poor and making decisions. Girls who were being trafficked on the streets. Those sisters had more resilience in their pinkies. I'm talking 14, 15, 16. Um, than many of the people that I know now who are in the highest realms of government. That work to me, it, it continues to shape my understanding of no matter what you do and how you are born, unless we deeply fix and shift systems, our people will not only be left behind, but they actually, um, they'll be in a situation where the liberty will continue to be taken away. I miss that work. So what, what, what grounds you? What connects you? What binds you? What's your North Star? How do you guide yourself through this journey? Because I know um, in working in the African American community, there's heartbreak, there's tragedy, there's betrayal, there's, a, there's, there's some dark, heavy emotions that also come with the work. How do you stay uplifted and encouraged? What is your guiding North Star? Liberation. All right. Okay. Liberation. Liberation for our people and what that looks like. I think that when we think about justice, I deeply center self in God, but when people say, well, you know, I don't really do religion, but I believe in justice. Well, how do you believe in justice and you haven't seen it? So you are obviously a person of faith. To be able to develop and understand and have a radical imagination where black people aren't stepped over right outside, right? Where they're not dying in the streets, where jails could actually be emptied and we take care of people who hurt and infringe upon others. Liberation actually looks like something that our grandmothers dreamed of. We are indeed the prayers of our grandmothers. So I don't work, I don't work, you knew my grandmother. Her funeral was at your church. Nobody in this room worked harder than your grandmother, right? Nobody. So when we think about what moves us, I think about what if I actually lived her dream? My grandmother never had a soapbox and got paid, actually had a career to work for the freedom of her people. She did it in the morning, she did it at night. She did it on the weekends, she did it while she was praying on her knees. I have this amazing privilege from nine to nine every single day to spout freedom and liberation and a radical, unapologetic understanding that black people must be in all leadership positions. I and mean, we get paid to say and do this stuff. We do. Let's bring Larry into this conversation. Because Larry actually has a really unique perspective. And sometimes it's uh, left, left uncovered, if you will, about finance, money. I've elected to a position that deals with taxes. Not many African Americans operating in that space. But as you know, when we are not covering that space, we are forgotten. And you mentioned that in your early remarks. So you've been on the front line of the financial and economic world working to address economic inequalities. Tell us what you found to be the most pressing need, and of course, tell us how you've tackled it. I mean, our financial needs are, are I don't want to be a downer, but are really yeah, unprecedented. I mean, the gap, the wealth gap, that we suffer from many economists that can never be closed in generations, right? That's if you accept present policy. But, it, but I think what my career has been about is about challenging and changing present policy so that we do have opportunity. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that's very hard for us to understand is the carry forward in discrimination. And it's real. So if you start, if you look at the federal programs that were established, FHA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Federal Home Loan Bank System, just in the housing finance area, that was done in the 30s. And basically what its success was by the 50s is that it took a lot of ethnic whites, the Irish, the Italians, Jews, Greeks, and took them from working class tenement world into the middle class in suburbia. 
blacks were systematically discriminated, dis not allowed to participate in a lot, of these, a lot of these efforts. It wasn't until Kennedy came into office in 61 that FHA federal, the, that was allowed to provide insurance in, in quote unquote changing neighborhoods, meaning when black people were moving in. So for you know all this wealth that was built up during that time, another period, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac didn't close, were required really until 1989. So the carry forward of discrimination is what you see with many of your colleagues. So you think you're making the salary and they're making a salary and you're living, each of you are living on the same salary. And then the young people are like, well, why is it they can afford this and they can afford that? What happens is to your grandmother's reference, their grandmothers are oftentimes providing the down payment for their existence. Their grandmothers oftentimes provided the tuition settlement. So and we, I, I own some property in DC and we actually, a buddy of mine owned that, we were like, we were rehabbing the building that we had gotten from a nonprofit, and we were noticing on the street that it had been black that was increasingly going white. Who are these young people who are coming and buying these condominiums with these older women? We kept, this is just bizarre. And then we kind of started asking questions. And it was grandma. Grandma was writing the check. So grandma was making it, they worked at the nonprofit. Grandma was putting 50% down. So their rent was, was, was affordable, and then they get a roommate, and then they own property. We don't, right, because we don't have that. Now, what really is annoying is grandma's money came from the fact that she was able to participate in a system that systematically, legally discriminated against us. This is the carry forward of discrimination into your generation. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. So when we seek racial redress in public policy, it is not us whining, it is not us complaining, it's us picking up the fact that we were systematically left out of the greatest wealth transfer this country did after the World War II. And so we have a right to be at the table in a real different way. So to answer your question, that's where my passion comes from. The interest is, how do you establish that through public policy and having people like you guys in policy is so important. Because not only do you get to raise the, t the question and have a seat at the table, you get to actually bring that history to that decision making. I mean, was it in Boston, there was a period in the late 80s and early 90s where they actually moved the subway station out of the black neighborhood. Okay? So don't forget what transit really means. On the tax side, my God, the tax code is where all experimentation is coming. So what we're advantaging and what we're disadvantaging what we're encouraging and not encouraging. Now, one of the lessons I think we need to bring to the table in public policy is what President Obama did. So one of the things we forget is that President Obama mainstreamed black issues as American issues. So a lot of the criminal justice reform we see now that we benefit from, he made that American. When you think of health care, we were 21% of the uninsured. Our rates are down to 14%. And if the states and the Confederacy actually took the health insurance, it'd be down to 7%. So who were the beneficiaries? Big city hospitals. What's a major employer of black women in this country? Big city hospitals. Okay, what was preserved during the last recession? Public sector work. Where, do we, where does our middle class work? The public sector. So Obama had a very big black agenda. It just wasn't called black. So in a state like California, that becomes really important because we're a minority to sort of look at the policies to see what benefits us, but make sure we have a coalition that can support it that's broader than us, is what we might like. So Larry, you, you actually touched on some really interesting points. I'm curious to know, how do we build structures that uh, would begin to um, deconstruct the barriers that um, government agencies, to stick with your example, have put in front of us. You know, when I think about structures, I think about when you go to the any community, you can go to a black or a brown community, you can see a check cash in place. You can see a check cash in place before you see a banking institution. Talk to me about ways that we can approach to build structures that will create equity for black people, um, uh, creating equity in our communities, uh, a space that is uh, that allows us to have real, measurable, and real tangible goals. No, that's a tough one. It's a, it's a fair question. I think when you look at the Community Development Financial Institution, CDFIs, they kind of were put in place to basically come to play the gap that banking is not providing for, for lending purposes. How do we expand their authorities? So I think one, one answer I would say is institutions. The second one is active engagement. Force the banks to comply with Community Reinvestment Act. Don't let them get away with forced Community Reinvestment Act to be done on the fintechs. I know some of them may be sponsoring your event. Well, that's their investment, right? There you go. About it. I mean, there you go. Force, force the issue. I mean, what we have to do systematically is not let our elected officials just get our vote and then go and put their act as business as usual. 
So letters to, look, democracy is something I'm really high on. Democracy really works. Letters to your congressman, letters to your congresswoman really matter. They listen. They go to the town hall, raise the question. They listen. Tell them I want you to convene these people, get five or six of you to do it, they're gonna listen. Why? Because they need your vote in two years. The greatest thing about democracy is the homeless person has a, the same share as the billionaire. And at election time, we spend a lot of time trying to get that homeless person to vote for us. Vote. Because we know how important that share is. Make that homeless person share count. Because your, your privilege is the fact that you can actually take that voice and take it into other rooms with these members of Congress and with these state representatives. But I'd say institution building and making the institutions work for you is probably the first step that we need to do on the financial rung. The second one, I think, is that we've got to demand that it not just be debt, but equity. That our problem is we can't just take a loan to start a business. We actually need equity and angel investors to actually make those things happen. You're in the middle of Silicon Valley, you know, 30 miles down the road. A lot of people who don't look like you get a check handed to them to go and take, take risks. Our kids don't get that opportunity. We should not sit back idly and, and not demand that. So what can we actually do, though? I mean, we've identified kind of the problem. We have identified what the symptoms are. But how do we begin to, in a very serious and meaningful way, address them? OK, Latifi, you want to take that? I will, because again, I've been you know, spending so much of my uh, adult career bitching at why things are so awful. Yes, uh, she has. Yes, I have. <laughs> and then to then have this opportunity um, to be on a board where we control $3.1 billion a year. And in my district alone, we can build 20,000 units of housing in the next 10 years. And the reason why our communities, I didn't realize it to me with my good ass job, I got pushed out of Oakland and had to live in Richmond. If I'm, I think I'm doing very well, but I refused to pay $4,500 for a three bedroom. So I realized, in, in the hood, so what I realized, like in, in, in the West, and so what I realized in, in my role um, as a BART director, and also my role as a California State University trustee, and we think about the land that the public owns, people must be housed. And so until we figure out how to actually create structures where not only people can be housed, but guess what, black developers and contractors actually control must, much of that process, structurally we won't have our hands um, not only on equity, but space. Um, West Oakland, uh, which is, again, it feels like home to me because I've been there for 15 years. We just pushed for and got an approval um, on, it'll be a black development of almost 40, 40, 38 stories, both housing and office space. And it's a black developer, Alan Dones. I think he's, is he in the room? Is he here? When he, the actor, one of the partners for that project is here. And stand up, because when we think about, yay, right? And being able to support that kind of development and being an activist and an organizer wouldn't have given me the opportunity to stand up to our board um, and to really work with the development partners um, to do something that will have deep, long-lasting, generational impacts on African Americans. Um, and so I, I think it's acting, and I think it's it's taking risk. And everybody in here, for the most part, in your in your in your companies, you have um, the power to both hire and contract with folks who look like you. And we have to do that. We have to we have to do that. Okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment. I'm going to probably tap into someone's mind in the room. They're probably thinking, Yeah, Latifah, easy for you to say. You're elected official. Yeah, Larry, you can sit from your throne and, and say what other people should be doing, but what about, I'm just a regular everyday person. I'm just struggling just to survive. What can I do? What can I really do? What kind of work can be done? Well, I think, you know, in this area in particular, you've got a tremendous amount of community development organizations. They need, they starve for people to be able to participate and to work with them. So you, your voice actually really matters. Your work actually really matters. Whether your work is literally folding the envelopes to get people to, to the letters to get people to come. Um, your engagement means that not only will you learn, but you also will give back, because voice matters. The second thing I think you could do is strengthening these organizations is also recruit others. Because I think it, and the third thing is, think of ways in which you can sign a petition letter. I mean, if you send a letter, if you started a letter that was going to Bank X that you knew was not providing loans, or if you knew, if you, if you knew that 
that uh, developer Y was that only building efficiencies for poor people and building really three bedrooms for rich people. And then you wanted to tell the mayor or the, or the city council, this is unacceptable. That matters. You can force the conversation. I mean, whether we agree with uh, Alexandria AOC, I can't I always remember our names, the congresswoman, the congresswoman from New York or not, on, on Amazon, but clearly that voice changed a dynamic and is going to change the conversations that community groups are going to have with major corporations henceforward. That courageous act, whether you agree with it or not, because there's people on the other side, like, well, we need those jobs. But it forces another kind of conversation about what it means to gentrify our communities, what it means to displace people, and what it means to actually make sure people who actually live in the community benefit from actually growth. And I think that kind of courage, because that came from the grassroots up. She didn't just do it on her own. She kept hearing it from home. I mean, the, the voice of the individual has never been more powerful than it is today. So just get engaged. Get engaged with community groups. Get engaged with the organizations. I'm sure you can name five of them right off your top of your head that actually need 20 people from this room to actually spend five hours a week. That's how you do it. And it's also, I think, the, the I mean, I, seeing so many people in this room that I know do this, I've seen you do it in very scary places, call out injustice in every single meeting. I can't believe some of the brands that are moving through the economy, just the, I mean, we can say Gucci, we can say, but the, 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 the I'm like, were there any black people in that room? <laughs> yes, there were. And they didn't say anything because the fear that we all have of being pushed out of doors that our grandmothers helped to push us into. But Michael McBride is a wonderful, wonderful faith leader in our community. And he said to me, and he was saying to other young people who have these positions, you have to work and be expected to not get elected, re-elected. You have to work and expect to get fired if you are going to be the voice and the heart of consciousness everywhere you are. Or, or and it's easier said than done when you got kids and your mother is sick. We have all been there. But you can choose to go along and uphold white supremacy or not. It is an absolute choice. It's a, white supremacy is not just about hate. It's about space. It's about space. And so when we, when we uphold white supremacy, we're allowing for that space and that power to shift, knowing our power is a lot stronger in that room if we decide, if we decide to champion who we are, what we need to be. And that includes being in, in every tech institution in San Francisco, racism is flagrant, flagrant. Um, and everyone who was there, who was of the diaspora, makes a decision to walk into hostile territory every single day. And that is, thank God, that is a choice. But that choice and that privilege also comes with a huge responsibility to rid these institutions of, of, of that demon, of that illness of racism. No, I think I think your point is well taken. I mean, I think it's very well taken because it's private sector and public sector. The question is, do we have the support system to support you who are in the tech community when you take on those issues? Have we have we written our twenty five dollar check to the NAACP or to the Urban League, so that somebody is there when you are taking on the challenge and they've got to feel that they've got to deal with that constituency that could be media savvy. We've got to be strategic in how we do it because we can't have you guys go in there and and sort of call out their racism and then be fired the next day and then we're just starting over all over and over again. You have to use your systems and your power, but I think you're absolutely right to look at the cultural norms that we are now developing here, uh, where, you, where it's more important that you fit in than that you're qualified. So that excludes us. When you look at algorithms that say, you know, going forward, we're gonna lend to communities that didn't have a high foreclosure rate. Well, guess what? That's a, that's a pretext to us. You know, when you guys are sitting at the table and you're seeing these things develop, sometimes you can't always answer the question, sometimes you can't always challenge, but we need to make sure you're bringing that back to the community so that others out there can raise the question on the outside and it comes back in on the inside and then you're part of the solution set. So we've gotta be more savvy and strategic, but we've gotta be informed by you as to what are the practices that are evolving that make you scratch your head a little bit and say, well, this isn't happenstance that this whole room is white and that I'm just the only person here and that I'm asked to sit in the corner and I'm not allowed to raise my question or not heard.
I think you guys are both touching on uh, the importance of having both an outside game as well as an inside game. And also, um, I think Latifah, also you drove this home, that we need to get out of that mentality of, I made it. If you're the only African American at the table that I made it, it really our role is not to just to be the only one to bring as many people as we can to, to, to the, um, to, from the community into the decision making spaces. And when I think about spaces, I've been thinking about how you guys have occupied spaces for the last 20 years at least. The last 20 years, maybe Larry, you might have a few more on us youngsters, but I'm 22. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I think that we, oftentimes when we have community dialogues like this, we talk about all the problems and, and, and all the shortcomings and what isn't working. I'd love for you to reflect on the last 20 years. What, have, what are the positive movements that have come through the fruits of your labor, that have uh, changed something, big or small changes? That, that, that's, that's it. Does it matter to me? But I want to hear about in the 20 year span, like what have you guys been doing? What have you seen? Who have you partnered with? How is how is this change really manifest? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't done anything by, by myself at all. Um, but uh, so I love that question because it actually um, makes me reflect. You know, when I when we were doing work here in San Francisco um, to de-incarcerate young people, we knew that there were folks in New York doing the same thing, and it was led by young people who had been in systems. What's so amazing to see, and you guys are going to um, hear from one of my dearest friends in the world in a minute, Alicia Garza. I don't know if she's here yet. Um, and the mothers oh, of the she's movement. She's back there. Hi, girl. You're know, a little blind. Uh, <laughs> but um, to see individual folks um, by hell or high water again decide to do some of the hardest work. Um, and to see and love on them. Um, I, I love seeing folks uh, work harder than me so that I could strive to work as hard as them. I really think it's important um, in the work that we do to just watch others um, and to be a part of something so, so much greater than ourselves. Um, I, I think that we have we have these really great roles. We have great titles. Some of us can pay our PG in one swipe every month instead of breaking it up. That's amazing. But people are still literally in cages and dying on the streets that look like us. In Oakland, I know I'm not done because in Oakland, 56% of black men are unemployed. And it's not because they are unemployable. It is because even in a town that grazes this amazing and laudable history, right, for black power, white employers, non-black employers still control economy. In South Africa, why the EFF is so important, and I'm able to watch that movement, those youngsters said even the, a the, the, the ANC is not looking at the fact that we have no land no political economy, right? We have the vote, but we have nothing else. And so until, Look at that. you know what I'm saying? People who thought they made it and who didn't understand the political identity of what liberation means. So for us, I actually do believe we have to work to the point where we make other people uncomfortable, regardless what sector we're in. We are not going away. Our politics of freedom and struggle, it's not going away. Um, and it's, it's, it's unfathomable to think you could sit in the pla a place and watch racism happen. I don't believe that that, that that condition, we have to get rid of that condition. I'm inspired by people who've decided. Alicia Garza said, look it, I don't need to work for you. I'll create my own stuff. <laughs> I, I, will, I will found a movement that say we matter, and we will go and do that work. And there is enough resource to fund that movement for our liberation. I don't have to work under a nonprofit organization that continues to see our people only by their means of production. So I love to watch. I love to learn. I love to be inspired and agitated by people who want to push me even more to the left. That's great. So no, I, that's powerful. And, 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 and right, <laughs> right, and right. I mean, I, to ask you to answer your question about the moment, I think mine was in 2012. I took a month. I took a month off every election cycle to sort of work in communities where the black vote un traditionally underperforms, and our organization makes sure it overperforms in, in these critical states. Because a lot of times it's just talking to people and reaching out to people that people don't want to talk to, and actually funding people on the street to actually go out and help people get come out and vote. Right, so we went to Ohio. I, this is my th that was my third trip into the, to, the, to Ohio, which was the pivotal state. 2012, if you remember, Obama's up for re-election. Things got really close in the fall. Uh, and what really inspired me were two things: one, the seriousness and purpose of the black vote—that it was quiet 
and unknown, and the overvote of black people in Cleveland and in Ohio is what put Obama over the top. If you remember, this is when uh, Karl Rove went crazy on Fox News. Like, they got a recount, they got a recount. It didn't happen in Ohio. That was his live moment. Because they thought they had worked it so much in Appalachia. But our people, our determination, this was going to happen. Those girls were not coming out of the White House, his daughters. That he was going to get another term. It's really what pushed over the top. And the fact that we forced coalitions with ethnic white unionized workers that in the Urban League in Akron, Ohio, when, when there was a convening about people coming out to vote, over 50% of the people in the room were white men. And the fact that they were comfortable coming into the Urban League and working for this black candidate, it inspired hope beyond hope that America could become America. That their economic issue, interests were tied with black economic interests, which has been the whole history of this country is to make sure that working class whites never see their economic interests tied to black people. And the fact that that actually was coming together was so powerful that that's how we got Donald Trump, I believe, in 16. Because they had to figure out a way to sort of break that apart. Because people were beginning to look beyond color, not completely, but when you got it done at the working class level, my line was pretty simple. If you voted for Obama, if you were a white guy who voted for Obama in 8 and 12, you kind of get out of race card free. You got to get out of race card. We got to talk about a different kind of racism that you're engaging in. But it's not just overt. And you got to be treated differently because you can be part of the cause. To go to your point, um, we're going to always need partners. Our partners are always going to be. We're going to. It's going to be fluid who our partners are, but our economic challenge is so different than any other people outside of Native Americans. It's so so different because it was so so systemic. Um, we don't have wealth in our community. We have a few wealthy people, but we don't have wealth. We have a middle class. That may or may, that's usually one or two paychecks away from, from a disaster, as we saw with the government shutdown. Right? We had so many people who thought they had made it suddenly were on the bread line. So, but we don't have wealth in our community. And it, we, a community that doesn't have wealth has a hard time being self sustaining and, and self deliberative in a capitalist economy. And I think that's why we got challenges of people on the left who say maybe we should be re thinking about whether the capitalism really works for us. And I get that. On the other side, I get if you're going to be capitalist, we've got to have some people who have some wealth that actually want to commit to community. And we can't have wealth that's just tied up in individuals. Ours has to be a community capital. All right, folks, we have another 10 minutes. And I think that uh, the, the, my final question that we are going to uh, dive into before we close out this panel is it's easy to sit up on the stage and you kind of see the finished product. Right? You finished all their schooling, all their hard work, all the pressures that have benefited and, and have brought forth these two diamonds. But I'd like you guys to go back, and if you went back to the past, or if you could, yes, if you could go back to your, your future, your uh, past self when you were maybe 12, what would you say? What kind of advice would you give? Well, I'm still raggedy. I couldn't find my keys this morning. I had to go out the back door and act like I was turning it so nobody would break in. Um, um, I, I think, you know, yet yeah, she still came up though. She's a homeowner now, you know what I mean? Like, she forgot that part of the story, but let's celebrate that. This is a big deal. You know, what's, what, what is amazing though, you know, we can, all, we can look back at our future selves, I mean our past selves. Um, what advice would you give? What's so great about looking, you know, at this audience and thinking about what if we actually were our true selves all the time with each other? Yeah. You know, that every single place that I go into, I want to bring my full self, not just part of it, my full self, the goofy, the raggedy, the, the, the all of those things, um, because I would tell my 12-year-old self, you are perfect. And, that, and that what's important about being a black girl and telling yourself that there is no room that you should not be in, there is no conversation that you cannot lead. There is no one who can outthink you but God. And for me understanding that now, after seeing so much, again, having been literally through so much tragedy personally, um, and yet still having to get out of bed every single morning and perform at the highest level, and I do that because I bring all of myself. So I would tell little Latifah, my glasses would be like this big. Yeah. <laughs> now they're just like this big. But tell that little girl that she absolutely would be in control, not only of her life, but that she was dignified and special enough to sit at the head 
I don't want to be in the middle of the table. I want to be at the head. Um, and I would ask all the girls, the older girls, the big girls, we're grown now, to believe that that's not only possible, but it is our divine position. All right, Larry, how about you? What would you tell your younger self? I can't top that one. <laughs> I mean, I think I would say the most important thing is always to, is to give back. That no matter how hard the road is, you've always got something to share, and you've always got something to give back, and you've always got to remember the dignity of every human being, and that you can always learn from everybody, and that the, the person who seems like they have the least amount to teach you, and that they have actually taught you something. That's right. And that you need to bring that to every room you go to. You know, you always bring that, that to that consciousness. I think the power of blackness is, is pretty special. I think oftentimes we, we see ourselves as having to overcome struggle and overcome dignity, but I think we bring a certain strength and a certain perspective to the room that nobody else does. Our struggle is real, it's American. It is not on foreign soil. Um, and I think what we bring to the table is a, as an empathy and a compassion and an understanding of other people and their plight. And don't ever lose that no matter how how high pollutant the room is that you've been in. Because if you don't bring that to the table, you're not bringing, you're not bringing your community and the people who actually got you to the table. All right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Parks and Latifa Simon. Wait, before we stop, I, we, have one, we have about three more minutes. Can we ask Malia a question? Yes. Okay, can we both ask a quick question? I'm sorry to break the protocol. Um, She's such a rule breaker. Oh, so, um, yes. you know, Malia, you had to be all over California during your race. I did, I was. Um, and um, it doesn't just, I mean, San Francisco, there's five black people left, but like, <laughs> when, you, when you go to other places, there's even less than that. Can you tell us about what it was, what, what was the most inspiring and most difficult, um, your moments as you were really doing living room politics all over the state, and why this particular position? So earlier you heard in the presentation from Larry when we're talking about finances, and we're talking about taxes, and we're talking about land use, and we're talking about community. One thing that I can see very early on from my service in San Francisco as, as the budget chair and as chair of the land use committee is the intersection about how decisions are made when it comes to land use development and, and material wealth that we can pass on generationally. It, it's, it's, it's stopping, it literally stops at a grandparents generation, grandmother passes away, and the house gets lost, it gets foreclosed on, lots of things that can happen. So I was a, a um, member of the Board of Supervisors, I represent Baby Hunters Point, and at the time when I was running in 2009, I had lost my own home in foreclosure in 2008, and I, well, my enemies tried to use that as a weapon against me, and what I came back with was a shocking statistic that that same year that I lost my home in foreclosure, 14 other black families lost in Baby Hunters Point. And so being real and always being mindful and cognizant about that, um, using that as a strength, as a policy platform to start talking about it, to be a real life example. Yes, it's embarrassing and yes, people shamed me for it, but I came through. My credit is great now, all these years later, and we still stand strong. So that's a little bit about, um, about just like finance. When I think about racist and predatory policies that were created in the 40s and 50s that redlined communities, there is a reason why black and brown communities are marginalized and our tax base is low. There is a reason why the tax base is low and therefore you find underperforming school. There's a direct correlation between taxes and public education. In the state of California, there's $5.7 billion of property that is assessed and 64 billion of that goes into public in, in education. So I'm a public school kid. Are you a public school kid? You a, are you a public school kid? All right, so we've got probably public school kids up here. London Breed's a public school kid. I mean, I believe in the public school system. So I really see the connection between taxes, money, public education, and future uplifting people and uplifting communities. Now you asked about what did I see when I was traveling up and down. I represent 9.9 .9 million people across the entire state of California, 23 counties. Most of my base is in the nine Bay Area counties. But what I saw when I was up in Del Norte and in Humboldt and Mendocino County, I was nervous to go up in those places where white people are, where there are real Republicans. <laughs> I never saw a MAGA hat in person until I went up into the rural areas. Um, one thing that I learned uh, very quickly is that we actually have more in common. Being poor, white, and rural, they need affordable housing. They also need transportation. There are literally Highway 1, parts of Highway 1 that are crumbling 
and falling into um, into into the sea, into the Pacific Ocean. Um, uh, poor water, internet access. I mean, there's a lot of things that really do connect the inner core, the inner parts of the communities that many of us circulate in um, with rural America. Uh, and I'm thinking about Fresno, I'm thinking about um, farming communities. So access to quality health care is incredibly important as well. So there are my, my High level lessons is that there are more things that bind us together that we have in common than that separate us. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for us. Thank you.